Hello and welcome back. And first things first, check out this awesome t-shirt. Uh, Headphone Jack over on the Discord made a beautiful rendition of the Centurion its peripherals in pixel art. So if you want to get uh, this t-shirt, there's a link in the description below. I don't really make any money off of the t-shirts. I sell them for like a dollar above cost. Uh, I just want people to have really cool shirts. Um, also, if you want to get the PNG or the uh, image file of this pixel art, hop over onto the Discord and shoot me a message. We can hook you up with it because the actual pixel art itself comes out so much sharper than what the ink on the shirt looks like. Uh, anyways, epic shirts aside, today we're actually back to working on the Centurion and we're going back into uh, working on this Finch Drive right here. Uh, we left off in a pretty interesting spot last time. We actually got the Finch Drive spun up and we could see how much data was on there. I mean, it's like packed full, but it's mostly oil and gas backups. There's no real software, there's no real operating system or anything really of interest on there. Although we did see that there was some source code hiding out in there. And I would really love to uh, dig through and comb through the files in more detail, but while we were running it, it died. <laughs> we were in the middle of reading a file and it just started erroring out within our disk five. We think NR means not ready. Um, so there's a, a potential that the drive failed in some way that it's no longer sitting a, sending a drive ready signal to the Centurion. And that's the Centurion's way of telling us that it's not ready. So I wanna fix that today. I wanna dive into this and get it up and going again so we can dig through the files and get stuff off of it. Now there is another problem that we have to solve uh, and that is indicated by the disk five. Uh, I don't have five disks on this machine, um, but well, <laughs> we had to register this one as disk five because two of the ports for Finch drives on the FFC card are bad. So probably they just have some bad uh, driver chips on them, but that's something else that we're going to have to really dig into and figure out. So first step is going to be printing out some pinouts. That's a, that's a weird one to say. I'm going to print out the pinout of the uh, connectors on the Finch drive here and the FFC. I'm going to hook them up into uh, that last port that actually works, start probing around and see what happened to our Finch drive. And then if we can get it up and going again, we'll rip data off of it as quick as possible. And then we'll shift focus over to the FFC and see if we can figure out what's going on with the other two ports on that one. I have no clue how far we'll make it today, but there's only really one way to find out and that's to get to work. All right, let's jump right into it. I've got the Hawk drive spun up. I've got the Finch spun up and that's, that's why it's kind of crazy loud in here. Uh, I've got the Hawk loaded into the question mark dot question mark Finch utility. We're going to use that to test the Finch drive a little more thoroughly. Essentially what I want is I want the Centurion to be sending the correct drive select signals to the Finch. So that way I can see if the failure is on the Finch or if it's on the FFC. Uh, so I need to get this Finch drive utility set up into a read test that's kind of sitting in a constant loop. And in order to do that, we'll just do uh, R for read test. We'll read a track. We want the drive number to be two because that's the uh, highest most port, the one that we're currently using. Uh, disk number we'll just set to zero. And we want our seek pattern to be, uh, well, I don't know, we'll say ascending. We'll do the low track at zero, zero. We'll do the high track at FF. Uh, and then we'll just hit enter on that. That's curious. It's, it's passing the read test. All right, that's really bonkers. It, I swear it wasn't working before. I mean, you guys saw the previous episode. So uh, let's exit out of that. I'll reset the system. We'll do H1 and we'll boot into the operating system here. Um, this is insane. I don't understand what on earth is going on here. Okay, max disk equals five. Uh, I mean, we've, we've gotten this far before. I, I have absolutely no idea why it's suddenly passed the read test. This is really strange to me. Um, okay, let's just do a death status. See what we get. <laughs> oh, oh, that's not good. Oh, that's, that's really interesting. It did detect that there was a finch, but we didn't get... It lost the name of the finch, but we have the data. Um... Boy, that's really not good. Okay, ZLO was the library that I think had our source code in it. So let me double check that right quick. 
Yeah, so that's our source code. That's the one that we really want to back up. So we'll just do an s.copy uh, zol from five to zol on one. We'll go ahead and hit enter. There is no in library, there's no out library. I guess that's copying over. Uh, yeah, there we go. All right, while that was copying over, I turned the lights off so maybe you guys can see the screen uh, a little better here. Um, but it looks like we actually managed to copy the ZOL library all the way over. So if I do a .drl ZOL.1, that should be reading the ZOL library on uh, the, the Hawk platter. So, so I think we managed to, to back that up. Let's just uh, double check. Let's do s.crt uh, and then we'll just check ZOA here. Um, Z O A, uh, and that's on one. And the library is Z O L. Yeah, that's all. That's all that source code that we really wanted to back up. So we've got it on the Hawk platter now. So we've got it in two places. Good chance that we're not going to lose it. The trick now is to get those off of the Hawk drive onto the laptop, so we can start digging through them in more detail without having this spun up. Okay, here's how we're going to back up the files. Uh, the Finch drive is off. It's not spinning at all. So don't worry about the uh, vibrations of me tapping on the laptop here, messing with it. Um, since we backed up all of the source code files that we really wanted to keep onto the Hawk drive, I'm just using that right now. So we're going to do this with TerraTerm and uh, the multi-terminal capability. So I've got the Centurion booted into the operating system. Uh, this CRT is CRT0. My laptop is CRT3 because I have it plugged into the bottommost port on the MUX. Uh, and right now on the laptop, we're looking at a directory listing of the uh, ZOL directory. Um, so I want to back up each one of these ASCII files. And to do this, we're going to use TerraTerm's logging capabilities. So we'll go up here and uh, the next one we want to back up is ZOC. So we'll do file log and we want to save that as ZOC.txt. Uh, I'll hit enter. Now it's logging everything that comes into the terminal or leaves the terminal. So anything I type will get logged. Anything that it receives from the Centurion will get logged. Now we want to just have it dump the entire file in one go. And we're going to do that with the LST uh, command. So uh, s.lst uh, and then zoc is our file that is on one and we want it to go to CRT3. So we'll go ahead and hit enter on that. It's going to ask me for the library. The library is zol. Uh, then we'll just go ahead and hit enter. And there we go. It is dumping the uh, source code directly to that file as fast as it can do it, which is actually 9600 baud because that's what we've got it set up as. We could probably bump it up to 19.2, but I don't have any flow control set up. So anything faster than 9600 and well, I got to start rewiring stuff. Uh, but it looks like it finished dumping it all. So uh, we will go file, stop logging, uh, and then we'll just open ZOC to confirm. And yeah, there we go. Full source code completely backed up on a text file right here on the laptop. I've got about 20 more files to do, so I'm just going to hunker down and get to it. All right, we've got all the source code backed up. We're kind of slowly digging through it. If we're going to find anything really exciting, it's going to take a while to figure that out. But the fact that we have it backed up is absolutely mega. So the next thing that I want to do is try to get the FFC working correctly. There are three Finch ports on there, port 0, 1, and 2. And both port 0 and port 1 did not work in our previous tests, which sent us on a rabbit hole thinking that there was something wrong with the Finch. But port 2 does work. So that eliminates some problems right off the bat. The big 50-pin command cable is working totally fine because that's shared by all three of those ports. So the fault is somewhere on one of the data cable ports. Uh, so there's just a couple of pins that we can check on that. I've got a list here of pins that I want to check, but in order to check those, I've got to get the FFC card out of the cage and out into the open. And that's where our little extension board here is going to make an appearance. I've actually used this before, despite the fact that I made a grave error and didn't put an extra ground pin along the bottom here. Either way, it still seemed to work just fine. So uh, we'll plug the FFC card into this and then get to probing and hopefully we can figure out what's going on. All right, let's check some of these. We'll start with uh, index. That's on J6 pin nine. Uh, so that's gonna be this one right here. 
and I got my scale all set wrong. But that is a clean index pulse coming in, so that's excellent news. Uh, now we can check it going out, that would be J6 pin 8, and we have a clean index signal going out, that's good. So let's check byte clock, that's going to be J6 pin 12. Uh, which is going to be this one right here. So we have a good bite clock coming in, and pin 11 is our bite clock out. We have a good bite clock going out. That's all excellent news that's coming in via the data cable uh, here, so we know that we're on the right port and we got everything selected correctly. Uh, next, let's check the uh, differential clock coming in. That's going to be on K5 pins 1 and 2, which is going to be over here. That doesn't look right even at 100 millivolts per division. I mean, we clearly have something coming in, but it's not very big. Uh, if we check pin two here, same thing. So we do have something coming in, but it's, it doesn't look quite right. If we check pin four, that should be the way out. So we'll check pin four there and nothing on the way out. Um, man, it sure does feel like this receiver chip is not doing what it's supposed to do. This is a 75108. I think I have some spare ones of these. And boy, that just, man, it sure feels like something is not right inside of that chip. Before we get to that, let me explain why I think that chip is the culprit. Uh, this is the schematic for the FFC, fully reverse engineered by Mesaka the hard way. Seriously stunning work. Thank you so much, Mesaka. But if we zoom in on the data connector over here on the side, we can see the inputs and outputs. Pin one is our index signal, and that checked good. Pin three is our byte clock, and that also checked good. Pins five and six are early and late strobes, but they're just tied high, so they're definitely not the problem. Pins nine, 10, 12, and 13 are all related to writing to the Finch, which is something the retests should never touch. So I think it's safe to eliminate those as potential problems for now. That just leaves pins 15, 16, 18, and 19. These are the four pins dedicated to the differential read clock and differential read data. And if we look right over here, all four of these feed right into a single SN75108. This is a dual line receiver chip that takes two differential inputs and outputs a TTL compatible signal. We can see that the output is gated by an AND gate, but that AND gate is controlled by the select to read signal. And I actually checked that one and it checked out good. So by process of elimination, there isn't anything else in here it could be except for a bad 75108. To replace that 75108, I need to first separate the two boards of the FFC by removing the five screws, and then carefully pry the sockets that connect the two boards apart. I've done this a few times before during the reverse engineering process, but it's always fiddly. Eventually though, it yields and the two halves come right apart. To remove the old IC, I'll first add some solder to the pins, then I'll just go through with my desoldering iron. And I get a lot of questions on what this iron is, and it's just an old Radio Shack desoldering iron. I'm not sure if it has a part number, but if you search for Radio Shack desoldering iron on Amazon, it, it pops up. So uh, anybody that's curious on getting one of these, it's fantastic. I absolutely love it as a desoldering iron. At any rate, after all the pins have been desoldered, a simple little pry tool will pop the IC right out. Uh, then I'll just clean up the pads with a little bit of alcohol and a very strange looking Q-tip. And finally, we'll solder in a new socket so we can drop new ICs in. Okay, I've got the FFC card back together. I took the, what I think is known good, uh, 75108 and popped it into port zero. Uh, I, I did this because I didn't have any spare 75108s. I've got some 107s, uh, but those are not open collector, I believe, so I can't actually use them here, even though they're pin compatible. But, well, I've got the Finch drive spun up now. It's done its self-seek test. It's ready to go. I've got the FFC plugged in and on. Uh, all we need to do is just double check that it's still working. So the first thing we'll do is we'll run a seek test. That's going to be 0F. And yeah, I can see the heads slowly seeking. So we'll hit control C. Once the heads go all the way out and all the way back in, we'll finish this test. That's good. That means that we didn't destroy anything on the FFC while we were working on it. There it goes. That test finished. 
Here's the big one, the read test. Uh, one, zero. Oh, well, we're getting further along. We're getting different errors, though. Oh, that's really interesting. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> but that's progress. That's definitely progress. Okay, I've got the Hawk spun up and the Finch spun up, and I pushed the FFC card back in. Maybe I was having trouble with the DMA cable or something like that. Maybe the extender card wasn't working quite right. So let's give it a test with the FFC all the way back in. We'll try to boot into the operating system here. We'll hit H1. Max disk equal three. That's excellent news. Uh, so 08, 23, 84. All right, let's do a .sta. Yeah, there we go. All right, so uh, one is soft term, two is offline. I think that's probably supposed to be the floppy. Uh, and then three is gonna be the port that we have the uh, Finch plugged into. Looks like it's working. It read a uh, Unicop there. Let's do a .dir3. Yeah, we've got the full directory listing. That was the problem. We have a bad 75108 on the FFC card. So I'll just get some of those on order and uh, pop a new one into the other ports and then this FFC card should be fully working. Uh, the next step is if we go back to STA here, uh, I want to see if I can get number two to be online here. Uh, so that means I need to make a new cable that plugs into a floppy drive and the Finch drive. That way we can have the Hawk and the floppy and the finch all working at the same time. I need a cable with two 50 pin card edge connectors on it and I found this one hanging about but it's way too short. Uh, if I can swap the female connector on the end to a male connector, I'll be able to plug a second 50 pin ribbon cable into it that, to act as an extension cable. Uh, to swap the connector over, I need to pry up on the locking tab and then pry the clamp off with a flat blade screwdriver. It's super fiddly, but I've, I finally got it off. And then I started prying the ribbon cable loose from the pins that stab through the wires. Uh, and finally, with it loose, I was able to just peel it off of those pins with relative ease. Now I just need to put the male connector onto this cable, and for that, I'll use the vise to just cinch it down nice and tight. Uh, I don't want to cinch it too far, I might crush the connector, but I think that's going to work pretty good. The uh, little locking tabs have locked into place, and that looks excellent. All right, I genuinely haven't tried this before, so this is going to be a little exciting. I've got the Finch mounted to a backing plate right next to the floppy. Uh, the hope is that the Hawk, which is already spun up, and the Finch and the floppy, all three of these drives will be visible within the OS and we can access them and do anything we want with them. So all we <laughs> got to do now is spin the Finch up. So I'll flip the power switch on. The Finch is spinning up. The floppy is on. The Finch did its self-seek, so let's hit H1. It should say max disk equal three, I think. Max disk equal five. That's interesting, <laughs> I was not expecting that. Uh, let's see what we see in the operating system. Okay, let's do a dot .sta. It did load the floppy, so it's checking the floppy. That's good news. Should be checking the Finch as well. Boy, STA sure is taking a long time. That's not great. So it hasn't halted, um, but something isn't right. So if we hit a control C there, let's do a dot dir uh, zero. I put a different removable platter in, so we can see that removable platter. And then we'll do a .dir1. That should be our primary removable platter. That's all still good, so the Hawk is still reading fine. DIR2 should be the floppy. It did load the floppy. It did read the floppy. That's excellent news. So now I should do a DIR3. <laughs> oh, that's a new one. Oh, I don't know what that means. That's not great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think I figured it out. Uh, the key was right here on this screen where it says max disk equals three is what it says now, but it was saying five before and 
that kind of seemed not right. So I went back into the uh, SysGen utility and I deleted the two extra Finch drives because we got nothing hooked up for those right now. And so maybe it was a daisy chaining problem where the operating system was expecting there to be more daisy chained on the command cable and there wasn't. So I think it's working now. So we'll go ahead and hit enter on this. We'll do 082384. Uh, we'll just enter the system time as uh, midnight, I think is what it defaults to there. Uh, it should say CRT0 ready. Yep. Now if we do a dot status, checks the floppy. <laughs> yes. There it is. Four full drives up and reading. It, it's actually just three separate drives. The Hawk shows up as two different platters. And I actually put a CPU6 platter back in there so we can see zero and one are both readable Hawk platters. Then we have our floppy disk and our Unicomp Finch. We have this thing properly kitted out right now. And the Finch is still working. Whoa, Finch is not working. What? Not ready disk three. That's the problem we were trying to fix at the beginning of all this. No, it's back. Oh God. Okay, that's, that's really interesting. I think I left all the cameras running. I had a, a thought, uh, what if I removed the floppy? Because the status was working, but maybe the, the directory wasn't, I mean, it's now working. Uh, not ready, went away. Um, this is so confusing. <laughs> so we've got two is offline because I just removed the floppy disk. And if there's no disk in the actual floppy drive, it just considers that drive to be offline. Uh, and with two offline, if I do a directory three, we can actually read the directory. Um, so we'll exit out of that. We'll push the floppy back into the floppy drive. We'll do a dot status. It'll check the floppy. We've got our four drives that we can select from. If I do a dot dir three, I get an invalid head select. What? is going on. That is a brand new failure. Let's do a directory two, so we can read the directory listing of the floppy drive. And then we'll do a dot directory three again. And then I get a not ready disk three failure. We can exit out of that. Let me eject the floppy. Just double check this for, you know, science sake. We'll do a dot status. Floppy drive is offline. Do a dot directory three. I can now read the directory. I don't know what's going on. I'm going to have to get on the horn with people smarter than me that remember this system. I must have something set up incorrectly here that's causing a problem whenever the floppy is online. All right, I think I've cracked it. It was actually dead simple. It was a simple setting on the floppy drive. Uh, I pulled up the manual for it. I'm using an NEC uh, half height eight inch floppy drive. Uh, and there is a jumper on there called the radial ready jumper. Uh, in the RX1 position, the ready signal from the disk drive is gated by the drive select signal. In the RX2 position, the ready signal is independent of the drive select signal. And it was set to RX2. So we had the ready signal from the floppy and the ready signal from the Finch colliding. They weren't working correctly, uh, which is why whenever I removed the disk, uh, it worked fine because then the floppy drive would go offline because there wasn't a disk installed. But uh, it seems to be working well now. So you can see I've got the status display pulled up here. We've got our four disks, uh, Data6, Soft Term, uh, Floppy, Dual Sided, Dual Density, that's what FDSDD stands for, and Unicomp. And where we were failing before is if we did a .dir3 to read Unicomp. But there it goes. It's reading Unicomp perfectly. And if we control C out of that and run a status again, and then we can do a dot dir2 and it reads our floppy perfectly. So there we go. We've got 
all four working perfectly. Uh, ultimately, three drives, but the operating system sees it as four individual drives that we can select. And man, just typing .sta and seeing all four of those come up and listed is just so cool. So there you have it. All three drives are spun up and working perfectly. No joke, they are currently up and running. I didn't even spin them down to film this outro. Turns out that we ultimately had a bad receiver chip on the Finch drive, and we had a bad driver chip on the FFC card. And um, troubleshooting the FFC would have absolutely been impossible if it wasn't for Mesaka's unbelievably good work and reverse engineering the FFC completely. We have a full schematic for it from Mesaka's work alone, and that is just stunning. Mesaka, I don't say this enough, but thank you so much. You are an absolute legend. Uh, so what's next? Uh, the biggest step is to get both of these into here. Uh, except I'm not going to use this floppy drive. This is a uh, NEC half-height floppy, and uh, as far as I know, Centurion never used half-height floppies. They used full-height 8-inch uh, floppy drives, and they always tended to mount them right here dead square in the center. So that's how we're going to mount it. We're going to mount a full-height right there. But the CEC full-height drive that I normally use, which is right over here, uh, is way too slow, required modified uh, uh, microcode on the FFC. So this little NEC one has a much faster seek rate and it can work with the original microcode. So what I need is a full height drive that actually works at the fast speed of our microcode. And uh, it just so happens that recently I was up in San Jose to visit the excellent Curious Mark, absolute amazing person. It was so much fun hanging out with him and uh, just to seeing all of his awesome epic stuff there. Uh, but he had a bunch of drives out of some HP drive units that happened to be CDC or Magnetic Peripherals built full height 8 inch floppy drives that have the fast seat. So this is the drive that is ultimately going to be going in here because Mark was kind enough to hook me up with this one. Uh, <laughs> I think it's going to look absolutely gorgeous in this machine. And being a CDC built drive, it is the proper drive for this machine. So I am really excited to get this hooked up to the FFC and get this and the Finch mounted inside of the machine so we can bring this primary cabinet up to a complete status. After that, we can get to work on the printer and the Phoenix drive in the secondary cabinet and filling that, that out. So we still got a ton of work to do, but man, today was an epic win, even though there was a moment where I didn't think it would be. So I want to thank you guys so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next episode.